everybody to the Martin E. Siegel Theatre Center. My name is Frank Henschken. I'm the director of this center. And um, this is now the middle of our season. November has started. That's so uh, beautiful. And uh, we have an evening uh, tonight, <coughs> which I think is of real significance. It's a, a field that uh, needs attention. Uh, Hans Kiesel Lehmann said, theater is a house and has many, many rooms. This is an addition in a way, to the big house of theater. Uh, in the last 2,000 years, when we look back, starting from Greek theater, we are now entering uh, in the digital world of the second digital revolution and the kind of uh, age of a kind of romantic relationship uh, to the very early internet and uh, me spaces, my space, and things are slowly over. And we have to engage uh, with what we called uh, tonight the virtual reality, the cyborgs, and the neuroscience. Um, we have uh, the honor to have with us tonight three uh, uh, emerging or also pra already practicing artists. They're from Lithuania, they are from uh, Montreal, and they are from uh, here in New York City. And um, they will share their work, uh, their ideas, their visions, and I hopefully will all point us towards uh, uh, fields we, we do not know, we haven't walked on, or, or the map is still being drawn. And so they are explorers, and uh, they will um, let us know about uh, their, the mechanics. It's, a, uh, I think, a truly um, significant uh, uh, development. Uh, Rancière, a French philosopher, said whenever traditional theater forms 
come together with no new technology, like very new technology, something happens. Uh, the art advances. And I think in theater performance and uh, the, uh, the digital uh, realm we all live in now, and, uh, and there are dramatic changes. We talked about in the afternoon, like the year 2026, is uh, people say the world will be completely different uh, than from the one we live in now. And uh, we are a little bit late, we just live in the moment, but artists do look forward. They anticipate the future, and what we hear tonight are messages, in a way, from the future. And that, from the back, very often, we also honor our great theater artists uh, from the past, and this is significant, and the artists who work in the moment. But this is um, something we are very proud of to have uh, Dr. Uh, Agora Parasit, Dominique Leclerc, and Lajun McMillan here with us tonight. Uh, and they also, uh, it's the first time for some of them uh, to be here at the Siegel Center, so it's uh, additionally uh, something that makes us very happy. We do Bridge Academia in professional theater, international and American theater. So this is right at the center um, of uh, what we are doing, and uh, we hope you will all uh, learn a lot from them. And I want to thank you also for taking the time to come out on a Monday evening and to listen to what uh, our artists um, have to say. The f format will be uh, three talks, 15 minutes around each. Then we will have a discussion here, and you will then talk and join uh, with us um, right away, and, um, and followed by a reception. If you do have a cell phone, just take it out for a moment. I do the same. And let's make sure it's off. One of the times for just demonstration, I push the button and I put it on on, and then of course I got a call. Uh, <laughs> in the middle, but I hope it won't uh, happen uh, again. So um, we're going to start the evening uh, right now, and uh, I'm going to ask uh, Jin to, to join us. She just flew in yesterday from Lithuania. Friday. Friday. Yeah, it's just for this event, and uh, we thank the Lithuanian government and also your own support uh, to make uh, this happen. So I'm going to read shortly uh, her bio. It's in here. But uh, Dr. Agora Parasit, Lithuania, is a female theater performance and film director, lecturer, methodologist, set designer, and a member of WIF, Women in Film, USA. Her conceptual aesthetic interests lie in the depths of the net, the act of browsing in itself as an infinite cognitive journey of collecting and identifying audiovisual experiences by which one learns about the world, through which they recreate a sense of self and collective identity. Her work is best illustrated by the performance as films such as Electric Dreams, she did in Israel, Psycho in Lithuania, Lab Psycho in Los Angeles, Self, Flash, Rome, and many others where cognitive, digital science, and faking becomes a tool for creativity in continuous performative acts. Thank you, Thank you so much. Um, good evening, everyone. Good evening. So we are uh, live streaming this. I would like also to welcome our audience members in HowlRound, and uh, that's also why we use the microphones for the others, but also later on when we talk. And so welcome to our uh, viewers. Uh, good evening again. It's a big pleasure to be here. Um, thank you, Frank, for a great introduction. So I will not keep you very long with all long introductions, but uh, I say that I will probably read a lot because for me it's easier to communicate, to kind of go through the process of my thoughts. And this is my first presentation of uh, this neuroscience and cognitive science. I use in, in collaborative processes with the theater of practices. Oh, yeah, I should be closer. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. This is the first time I used uh, videos in PDF format. It doesn't work very well, but... Okay, so my, I work in the name of Dr. Goraparazit, and Goraparazit is an existing mountain far away in Kamchatka, situated on Atlasov Island, known by Russian as Ostrov Atlasov, and in Japanese as Araido. Araido is the highest volcano, and also the northernmost island in Kuril Islands. There are two hills on this island. One of them is called Gora Osoboya, Mountain Special, and the other one is called Gora Parazit, and it's me. Here you go. This is this. Okay, so today I will go through all my work, not all, the part of my work through the uh, 
more neuroscience applied teaching processes. So in my work, I place training at the interface between teaching, research, and directing. It is the primary instrument of the results that will be displayed in the screen here today. So by linking a number of exercises to cognitive neuroscience, uh, my idea is to stimulate the actor's reflection on their practice, the formative self, the actor scientist. So here in the image we see a picture of staging tuk-tuk anamnesis which being staged in 2015 in Art Biennale Lithuania. And stage was purely inspired by the science direct consciousness and cognition magazine article Remembering and Imagining the Role of the Self. Article suggests that life narrative structures are used to organize future events as well as the memories. This study investigated whether temporal clustering of autobiographical memories around periods of a self-development would also cure when imagining future events associated with the self. So for this performance, we tweaked this task a little bit and participants completed and autobiographical tasks and future thinking tasks as sounds and images. In both tasks, memories and future events were cued using participant-generated identity statements. For example, I'm a mother, I'm a student. That was our performance script, uh, which later Ron gained an aesthetical features according to the talks and research. Um, so although research was a little bit more exposed, acting was on, on, the, on the second side and actors were kind of complaining, noted that there's not too much acting, we're just exposing the research. And that was an interesting point to start talking about where cognition science come into the performance, theatrical arts. There were parts where participants could not remember moments from their past or would not have imagined the future. So we placed and designed the brain as a core character in those void places. I could not resist just to remind ourselves that the brain uh, has a very powerful organization effect of the self. So this is a video of the performance. So with this staging, we address the question for the kind of the first time in our practices of active training and how the exchange with cognitive neuroscience could help better understand the acting profession. So in neuropsychological terms, it may concern the processes of action planning, postural control, decision making, and body scheme. Um, so one of the toughest prejudices, considering the actor as someone who has, has a very good uh, kind of skill imitating reality. So this is an image from selfless performance that is being staged in 2016. And stage acting is not merely acting on the stage, but it's a kind of acting that is supposed to constantly keep, feed, and rule the attention of the spectator. So it has to be visually pleasing. There is this kind of rule that you have to do. So a practical e example can maybe be uh, this con if the, to make this concept clearer, if the, an actor has to drink um, a glass on a stage, every motor act he is going to activate, grabbing the glass, bringing the glass to his mouth, swallowing the water, put the glass again the table, on the table, will be aimed at performing the act of drinking glass of the water. But although the action is factually the same and follows the same series of motor acts, and it is performed at the same time, it will be different, since the actor is here supposed to stimulate the spectator's attention. The same action has at once two different aims. This gives rise to so-called double intention or dilated intention of the actor that broadens from the performed action out to the audience. We can reasonably suppose that such a broadening of the intention concerns a peculiar neuromotor, neuromotor dimensions. So these double dilated intentions directly are represented in the performance's love. <laughs> Here the actors have to recreate many sport stills, images directly, uh, and by re repeating it again and again, they gain another logic on the top.
performance, I think. Next the one is selfless. Dream is dead. So even in a solo play, um, the performer may, for example, perceive actions from audiences as well as his or her own actions in his or her peripheral vision, as well as his or her imaginary projections. A more common illustration of such a tension mechanism can be noticed when we learn to drive a car. Uh, when we learned how to drive, only experience, the hours spent driving allow us to free our attention, talk to the, you know, someone who's next to you, look at the landscape or sing aloud while driving. Uh, some tasks have been integrated to another level that is pre-conscious. So through practice we are creating a body scheme that is adapted to driving. The same in the performance. We're adapting a body scheme that is consistently made of the, of the images. Here the actress is recreating, she's actually uh, is recreating one image still from the uh, tennis game still, but at the same time, not only she's recreating tennis image still, she has her logic. Um, she also cares about the camera angle. She has many, many moments, and I think this this really represents this represents the stillness at the same time. Very complicated neuromotor dimensions. What's happening in her mind at the moment? The same with the opera. Uh, that I directed last year. I applied the same methods to opera singers to recreate many images and so at the same time they had to sing their parts. And I think for them that was easier to execute because this, they have this uh, dimensional thinking because they are used to learn the musical text, they used to learn to sing, then apply the acting on the top. So once the new body scheme is created, the subject can add some new constraints to in order to continue this process of fragmentation and reconstruction of the, in deeper level. That is why, as we said, a good exercise allows to continue sharpening its constraints further. The actor must reach a new uh, pre-reflective uh, pre uh, pre control, which unlike everyday pre-reflective control has to allow his intention to broaden out to the spectator so that the actor can play with him, surprise him, listen to his breath, feel his level of attention, in so doing, uh, he can make every performance a unique experience as authentic complex relationship instead of a mere automatic repetition of a series of acts. So later on, we're going to see my performance of Psycho and Electric Dreams, uh, which has ex they, they exercise works, they, they precisely show exercises on the process of fragmentation and reconstruction. So the actor train, training exercises are based on applying constraints to the simple action of mimicking the movies. Going to deeper level of detail means also learning the engaged entire body in the every action. This is because an act is required not only to reproduce a sustainable intention, but uh, also to have an unusual control of his whole body during the performance. <laughs> Do you mind telling another man? Yes. 
Thank you. You may love someone, and you can dream of them like you. Like, for example, this is the example. Not true. I'll go if I love Clark. And this is not true. Remember, it's just an example. <laughs> I love Clark, but he doesn't know that I love him. So she and could dream of me knowing. Then we get married. What comes out of You just killed him for the fun of it, eh? Dreams kind of help you, really, in life, really. Because they... They give you, like, clues of the future, but very hard clues. If we don't have dreams, we wouldn't be able to notify our minds into wonderful things or horrible things. While we're sleeping, we can do that while we're awake. But the question is, can we do that while we're sleeping? Yes, if we dream. <laughs> right now, we're inside a computer program. No, you are not. You have got the ambition. The doctor. This is Commander Pavel Jacob, acting science officer. <laughs> So um, here are a couple of the performances, and I wanted to show a few of them in a row just to represent the methods. It's very resultative work, but behind that we have lots of kind of a rehearsal space. If you have questions after that, you just come and ask or ask after later. I will definitely share. Just, uh, I have 15 minutes, so I have to. I wanted to show a little bit more of the kind of visual part of it. So, concluding my presentation. Moment. See, that's when we apply video on PDF. It doesn't really perfectly work. Hmm? <coughs> Sorry. So it's one of my latest works, actually executing the idea of stillness, but having this dimensional thinking inside of the actors, kind of the brain processes. So concluding my presentation, I want just to kind of erase the problem why I'm working on this and why I'm kind of comparing and working 
in the multiple dimensions with the cognitive sciences and theoretical arts. So I think the biggest problem is that among a substantially increased interaction between cognitive neuroscience and the performing arts, numerous conferences and seminars worldwide, core elements of performance practice, such as performance learning and creative processes, were rarely investigated. In this sense, I believe that cognitive neuroscience can, can contribute towards a deep appreciation of ongoing training, besides rehearsals, and it is important for creativity in the performance. At the same time, the performing arts may contribute towards a more holistic approach in research in human condition. And uh, it goes, it may go towards some kind of embodied methodology when considering creative practices, and I call it massive research opportunities. So I'm doing it, and I will continue doing. Um, and uh, recently we started to execute a number of, of uh, kind of more sculptural process, uh, processes and performances. So this one of it, it's called pipe dreaming. And we're recording kind of a brain activity of the performance inside of the latex vacuum uh, with the VR, augmented reality. And it's still on the process. Um, I, I hope next time I will be able to tell you more about it. So actually, this is a hockey team, the girls hockey team inside. So that's where we lived over. Yeah. So um, that's it. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you um, very much. And I um, also want to point out she got the award as the uh, best young opera director in Lithuania for her work in this most probably of the Baltic states, the most uh, original one, and our colleague just won the Viennese Biennale for our work, um, if you heard it on the beach, the beach piece. So um, the very significant um, um, impulses coming um, from the region. And now we have with us uh, Dominique Leclerc. She's an author, co-stage director, and actress in Post Humans. Humans, first produced 2017 in Montreal, L'Espace Libre, where it was presented again in 2019 then toured across Quebec at the Cafour International de Théâtre de Québec and the Festival of International New Drama, FIND, at the Schaubühne in Berlin. Post Humains was a 2018 finalist of the Michel Tremblay Award, which honors the best text transposed on stage, a very significant recognition uh, in Canada and in the world of theater, and the play is published by L'Instant Même editors, and I also would like to uh, thank uh, at the moment uh, Emmanuel Seurat, who helped us uh, to bring her over, introduced us to her work, and uh, so thank you. Dominique. Hi, really happy to be here. Thanks for the invitation. So um, last year, while trying to get rid of some objects, I found a little notebook I was using back in 2002 in which I had written, uh, I want to mix documentary and fiction. I was 21 years old, I was uh, finishing theater school, and then it took me 11 years to find the topic that would make me devote myself, body and soul, uh, for it, uh, to it for years. In 2013, I heard about the transhumanist movement for the first time. So one of the challenges I always face uh, with this theme is that I never know uh, if people I'm talking to have a big knowledge of the topic or not. So my feeling today is that most of the people here do have heard or uh, read about it, but just to make sure I leave nobody behind, I'll give a short definition. Even if it's really delicate to shortly define this group because the show is all about bringing nuances. So, to sum it up, transhumanism is a movement gaining popularity around the world through various groups, private companies, including Google Alphabet, especially with their division Verily and Calico, uni through university researchers and more and more political parties around the world. Uh, transhumanists refuse and want to overcome suffering, illness, aging, and death. They work to improve and expand, somebody's laughing, it's good. <laughs> they want to improve and expand human capabilities by coupling the human body with NBIC technologies. 
nanotechnology, biotechnology, information technology, and cognitive science. Some of them, not all of them, now believe that in 2029, we will enter the era of the singularity, a period during which humanity will experience changes that are so far reaching and profound that it will not be, uh, that it will no longer be possible to distinguish between man and machine. So I became really obsessed by it. <laughs> uh, in 2013, the debate around enhancing the body with technology was totally on it unexisting in the public sphere in Canada, even if it raises critical ethical issues that are overturning our very notion of human nature. So as it really does concern everybody, as this theme may be um, intimidating for some people at first glance, I created a Posthuman to demystify this urgent societal debate to create a unique space where the audience and the performers can meet and be confronted with hopes, the desires, paradox, and fears that are driving us to rethink and modify human nature. So to sum it up, Posthuman is a documentary, auto-fictional, and performative theatrical production that pr transposes on stage a narrative of five years of research and encounters with people at the heart of the cyborg and transhumanist movement. Um, throughout my research, I realized that I can personally more easily measure my personal ethics when I meet people face to face. Uh, when I just read about it, uh, it's, it's really easy to condemn these augmentative uh, utopias. But by discussing with people from this movement, I found out that the personal motivation of transhumanists are deeply human, sensitive, they join us all, and that, that is what troubles me the most. What if I would offer you the possibility to stop suffering, being sick, avoid dying? What if I would offer you the possibility to stop your aging process? 20 years ago, all of this wouldn't have touched me, but as, as I am aging, I see myself more and more tempted by these hopes. When people are healthy, super easy to find, uh, to oppose to transhumanism. That's egoistic, unrealistic, crazy, that's bullshit. But usually when they're suffering and a solution, humans just take it. So during four years, I hardly searched the most efficient and sensitive angle to talk about this. At first, I was totally trying to avoid talking about me. But the more I digged into this really complex world, the more it became clear to me that the only way to make it universal was to go really personal. So I scripted myself a story for the play, but also a story that would have an impact on my reality. So I staged my personal need of augmentation. I'm diabetic type one since 14 years now, so my longevity and my quality of life are closely dependent on the technological evolu evolution of pharmaceutical devices that are available on the market. So uh, after 10 years of feeling imprisoned with this very obsolete, expensive, and inefficient device to measure my blood sugar level, I started to search for alternatives. In 2015, Google X Lab was working on a lens, on a lens that could measure blood sugar level in tears. But as it is out of question for me to give away my health data to Google, I started to look through scale inventors among the cyborg and biohacking community, hoping to find someone that could create something interesting and independent for me. I started to attend the cyborg group in Berlin I discovered creators, makers that implant tools in their bodies to create and augment senses or abilities. These were my first real contacts with people really blurring the lines between curative and enhancement medicine. First meeting with them, I was just totally lost. So when does the cyborg start? With your glasses, a telescope, a contraceptive pill, 
which is not creative, a pacemaker, an RFID chip, my phone, in which I transfer a lot of capacities now. We're probably all cyborgs. So by following this group, I also met transhumanists, people fighting for radical life extension, wishing to overcome their biology, take control on our evolution. Isn't it what we're doing all the time? Also, people comparing my body to a meat sack, which means that there's no connection between brain and the body to them. So am I just a meat sack? So from my glucose meter to the RFID chip I implanted in my hand, I'll come back to this later, to cryonics and brain upload to the cloud, I explore various augmentation utopias on stage to measure my limits, the public's limits, but also the limit of my life partner, Dennis, that is playing his own role on stage with me and who is my technical director right now. <laughs> Dennis is a journalist. As the witness to my discoveries uh, since many years, his reactions and reflections on all of this have evolved too, and I documented these changes. So when I came back from my first cyborg meeting in Berlin and I told him that somebody just offered me a non-creative implant, this was his reaction. And then a couple of months later, we both participated to the first international cyborg congress that took place in Dusseldorf. After we assisted to a couple of implant parties, I asked them a second time. I was being a magnet and implanted this finger and the magnet is not being. It changed a little bit. Remember the last time you talked about it? Okay, it's cool. That's fun. Yeah. If you get an implant, So Dennis' presence on stage with me allows to explore the vicissitude of a couple trying to agree on their respective limits in the here and now, but also on what they expect of the future. Will we manage to agree on shared augmentations? And what if one, what if one, one of us refuses to accept the death of the other? How far are we willing to go? Alongside our narrative, Posthumain explores and tests the audience desires and limit. So just before the show starts, spectators are invited to visit on stage our exhibition space. They're immediately in contact with texts, objects, and videos that plunge them uh, freely into our topic. They are also invited to answer four questions. Which part of your body would you want to change or improve? Which sense would you develop or improve? They write down their answers and leave it in the exhib exhibition space. We later use the, their answers in the show to bring the transhumanist desires closer to the public ones so we can meet somewhere in the middle in the gray zone. All along the show, other questions appear on screen to punctuate the stages of the story. So this is the very qu first question of the show. So I think most of the pe people in the venue would say no. So this is just before I start with my own narrative. And later, will you accept the consequences of aging? What was your biggest loss? These questions are addressed to maintain a constant link with the audience so they can, alongside Dennis and I, work through the, our years of thinking about these issues, a period marked by constantly changing opinions. And as a symbol of these constant shifts of opinions, in 2017, at the Oftea Festival in Montreal, as a performance, Dennis and I implanted an RFID chip on stage in our hands. The performance was presented twice, 
The first evening was my implant. The second evening was Dennis' implant. In our timeline of four years, the air FID implant is just one day, the day we both agree on the same augmentation. We wanted to bring the attention on the fact that RFID chip is the first technology that gets in the body that is not curative. It is the moment to reflect on it, talk about it. Now, two years later, our chip is already really vintage. <laughs> the capacity are, of it are already improved and will keep going with time. And we surely hope that no company or governments will force people to chip themselves. We did it because we were free and because that was our free will. Instead of programming our chips to open lights, doors, or computers like most users do, we decided to store our wedding certificates in these chips. So we both have our Canadian and German wedding certificate and a Polaroid picture of both of us. Um, we wanted to treat this gesture as a digital wedding to uh, bring a poetic touch to something that might appear really disgusting to the majority of the population, <laughs> except in Sweden. It's really popular right now. <laughs> so let's go back to Postume, the main show. Uh, so Dennis and I are playing our story, but we're also joined on stage by two actors that help us to build that narrative. Uh, they sometimes uh, add information, play some characters. Sometimes we see videos of these characters I met or they can share their opinions also. Um, the video conception uh, that was designed by the artist Push One Stop, and it sometimes interacts with the body of the performance. So there's a real encounter between the body and uh, the machine on stage. Um, maybe we look at a little scene. <laughs> This is to measure our brain waves in real time. We're acting like this. So he says he's always more calm than me. So he says that um, when we were in a conference together, he bought me a little Christmas gift. It's an intelligent vibrator that reacts to his voice. So I ask him if it's a good idea if my, this data of, of me is in the cloud. So that's uh, one of my favorite books, Stefan Zweig book. So he reads the text uh, to see how, uh, how much pleasure <laughs> I have. So it gives me a second gift. And it's a connected glucose meter. So I don't really get it. He wants to receive an alert in case something's going wrong with me, which I don't really get. So we get it. I, I get mad and the brain waves just explode. <laughs> so 
the thing we are the most uh, proud of, I would say, is that we have welcomed a very diverse audience, and that was the main goal. All generations, teens, elders, adults, specialists, and neophytes of science united. Um, so I'm actually working on a second show on the same topic, but I'm trying to go in an, another, complete other form. Um, as Peter Drucker said, the best way to predict the future is to create it. So that's what I'm trying to do. Thanks for your great attention. Thank you, Dominique, for, 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 for sharing also very personal uh, stories, and it's uh, quite, um, quite an interesting work for the stage and on stage. Now we welcome uh, Lajun Macmillan, who's a New York City-based new media artist, a creative technologist, creating art that integrates performance, virtual reality, and physical computing to question our current forms of communication. Lajun has the opportunity to show and speak about her work at Pioneer's work, about, about their work at Pioneer's work, National Creative Tech Week, and Art and Code Sweet Reality. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, Um, yeah, my name is La Jeanne, and I am a new media artist working at the intersection of performance and technology. Um, I've worked on uh, many different projects, um, including um, motion capture technology, uh, as well as uh, extended reality, um, which is an umbrella term for virtual reality, augmented reality, and mixed reality. Um, I started this work during my time at NYU Tandon School of Engineering um, as part of their integrated digital media program. And so um, while I was there, I was able to um, basically just explore all different types of technology, um, which uh, just has been a really like um, exp expansive experience for me um, as a person as well as an artist. Um, and so once I left school, I realized that my access to the spaces that I had uh, just been introduced to was, was vastly limited. And so I decided that instead of just being sad about it, that I would start to build spaces um, for myself and for my community and for people who um, were interested in joining that as well. So that brings me to uh, my project. And uh, it's called the Black Movement Project, and it's an online database of black uh, character-based models as well as motion capture data from black performance artists. And um, essentially, motion capture is uh, taking data from um, people, and uh, it allows you to apply that data to um, 3D characters um, as well as um, just like anything in the 3D world. Um, and the reason why I'm creating this space is because uh, there are existing motion capture libraries and uh, character uh, libraries as well. However, they lack diversity um, within the movements um, as well as with the, um, with, the, with the characters that are presented there as well. So this is one of the motion capture libraries. And um, this is actually like a, a character that I created in Daz, uh, which is a 3D character building software. And so um, just for an example for you, like this is um, basically the movement that they have on there for hip hop dancing. And uh, as you can see, this is not hip hop dancing. So <laughs> it's like a weird like shimmy. And so um, just thinking about the ways in which, you know, uh, culture is diluted um, depending on who uh, is in control of you know, building that space. Um, but then uh, during, uh, so I actually started this work uh, as part of a residency uh, at iBeam, which is an art and technology center in Brooklyn. And um, during my first month of the residency, uh, there were lawsuits for, the, for Fortnite. And Fortnite is a video game made by Epic Games. And essentially, uh, Epic Games uh, 
stole a bunch of dances from different uh, black performance artists. And, the, uh, and what's, uh, what's really problematic about this is that they not only took the dances, um, but they did not compensate any of the people that they took the dances from, and they uh, changed the names of the dances in the game as well. So um, right here uh, on the screen, uh, there is a dance of the Millie Rock, but they changed the dance name to the Swipe It. And so I realized that, you know, that I needed to take a step back with my project um, because it provided me uh, an opportunity to create a space where I was potentially pr uh, protecting a uh, black performance artist. And so I decided to really try to think about how I could do that. And so I began to think about all of these questions. And the first one was how, can we, how do we combat the exploitation, erasure, and dilution of black culture? And uh, I think that this is a very important question because uh, within like this digital space, uh, this is one space where you know black culture is exploited however you know black culture has been exploited you know since the beginning of you know time and so what does it mean to finally like take a stance against that and say no like this is our culture this is important to us and how can i and how can we as a community build spaces where we're finally getting compensated and finally getting um compensated fairly and credited fairly for the work that we do. And you know, and then how can we build stories where our stories, where, how can we build spaces where our stories are safe, understood, and celebrated? Um, so yeah, just like what, how, how do we begin to create new platforms um, where uh, we're just making sure that we are celebrating our culture? And that basically transformed my entire project into a library. So um, I decided to start moving away from just uh, the tool itself, and um, I began to dive into what it could mean for this space to be uh, a library, both online and also in the physical space. Um, and so it expanded into a library for activists, performers, and um, artists to create diverse extended reality projects, but also a space for research of how and why we move in an archive of our existence. And uh, this project is really inspired by Catherine Dunham. And Catherine Dunham was an anthropologist, uh, a, a teacher, a, a dancer, a, a choreographer, a, an activist. And she was just so many things. And she actually, I, I would credit her with the first person, as the first person who created the Black Movement Project, because she actually, um, in the 1930s, traveled throughout the uh, Caribbean basically documenting different cultures uh, through writings and um, as well as video. And uh, this is from her field work in Martinique in 1936. And so, um, and, but the really beautiful part about her work is that she also used that to, to basically inspire and, um, and dig deeper into her own performances um, because she was a dancer as well. And so that said, the Black Movement Project seeks not only to catalog movement, but um, to build community through performances, workshops, conversations, and tool building. And so for the performance, uh, basically it incorporates a narrative component to be seen as both a live performance and as well as a virtual reality performance. And uh, basically it shows how uh, black movement has been used as the tool of preservation of culture, um, as well as a vehicle of self-evolution. So what happens during these performances is that um, when people come to them, uh, I, I actually have done interviews with uh, each performer and recorded them. And um, through each interview recording, I actually um, worked with uh, like different sound engineers. Um, in this case, um, Nala was one of them, and then um, Jeremiah Johnson um, was another one. And uh, we basically worked to integrate these interviews to be uh, uh, sort of snippets um, in and out of the soundscapes. So uh, when you come to the performance, you're not only watching the performers perform, but you're learning about them as people. And I think that that's really important because even in the previous motion capture libraries, one of the, one, another problematic thing about them is that they try to remove the movements from the performers, which I find just to be wrong. <laughs> I think that, you know, you can't just 
have somebody's movements in a library, but then call them subjects. You know, you actually have to have their names there, and you know, and tell their stories. Because if people were to actually use them for their for their own uh, projects, um, it's really important that they know who's in the suit, that they know where they got the data from, and that we're properly ca cataloging that as well. And so for this first performance, uh, I worked with uh, two dancers. Um, one is Nala Duma, and he is a student at the Clive Davis School at NYU. And the other performer is Ronaldo Maurice, who is actually uh, a dancer with Alvin Ailey. So that was really exciting to sort of um, have a performance as well, showing like a bridge of like transition between like how movement um, evolves. Uh, and so um, for this performance, I used the Perception Neuron Suit, which is a standalone motion capture suit, um, as well as Unreal Engine, which is a, a gaming uh, engine which allows you to build video games. It's actually the same platform that Fortnite uh, uh, was built with. And um, basically, I used the suit to um, send the movement data to Unreal in real time. And then from there, I. Uh, basically create these 3D environments um, based off the interviews that I have with um, them as well. And um, now I'm just going to show you a video snippet of like the first performance. So, okay. Oops, that's not it. <laughs> I'll tab. There we go. <laughs> And then, um, and now I've been working on um, actually like taking the data from that performance and creating um, both a 2D and virtual reality performance. So I'll show you a snippet of that. And this is Nala. So it's the same music, but just like a three minute snippet.
So, yeah. Um, I'm still working on that, though. So, um, that should be done, like, within, like, the next month or so. Um, but yeah, but then from there, um, after the first performance, I realized that I needed to actually do this work myself. And so I have a background in figure skating, and I realized that um, I needed to um, work on uh, rediscovering and redefining my own movement journey. And so um, midway through my residency, I actually like ended up going to Minneapolis for a month and joining an all African American figure skating company. And what was really cool about that experience was that uh, within the company, we were basically diving into 17th century social dance. Um, and, and the particular social dance that we were uh, working with was a uh, ring shout. And so that was really um, a transformative experience for me because it really made me think about and really like dive into the work of what it means to redefine a space and what it means to like really understand what space means. And so from there, um, I developed a workshop series called Understanding, Transforming, and Preserving Black Movement in Digital Spaces. And basically, um, in that workshop, I'm, I basically brought together, uh, in the first one, I brought together uh, 15 people of color um, to basically take them through uh, the, the process of taking motion capture, applying it to characters that they created, and then taking that and putting it into a digital space. But what is special about this uh, workshop is that we are also critiquing the tools as we work with them. So um, a lot of these tools have inherent biases placed within them. And one of, an, an example of that would be that uh, there are a lot of character building softwares out there um, where the base body is a white, able-bodied, thin character. And so um, what does it mean to have, to, to build this discussion to say like, you know, how do we build um, within these parameters, but how do we begin to like challenge those spaces as well and challenge what the base body is? Because just because, um, you know, this is software, right, where the base body is, but we can also see the base body in so many other different um, places within society. Um, but then it also, uh, I also began a series of conversations, bringing people from different industries together. And I actually hosted this at iBeam two weeks ago. And so I brought uh, Amy Meredith Cox and Yusuf Cole. And Amy Meredith Cox is a dancer um, and a dance anthropologist and a professor at Yale. And Yusuf Cole is a writer and animator. And he writes about video games uh, as they relate to culture, class, and race. And so, uh, it was really important to like bring them together because um, I just wanted to see like how like these different conversations can blossom and also like what black movement meant to them because that's really helpful for me to in what I'm trying to do with building this space. And so um, I just wanted to leave you with, you know, the Black Movement Project is a movement. It's a movement to celebrate ourselves. It's a movement to protect ourselves, to really think about what it means to um, what it means for our bodies to you know be in spaces and also like what it means for us to you know challenge society and societal norms and to uh, basically just uh, think about how we can do a lot of different projects in ethical ways. So yeah, thanks. <laughs> Wow, thank you, Lajundi. So I would like to ask our uh, uh, panelists to come um, 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 forward. And um, Um, yeah, so um, that is uh, just very, very impressive. Uh, the, the range and the uh, complexity, also the um, the, uh, the diversity of um, um, of the work, and uh, all of you. I think we, we, each one of you, we could have spent an evening or a day with workshops. So um, thank you for condensing it in such a um, short 
a, a way, but I think it communicates of a world um, that's out there in theater performance and the digital realm that is of true significance. And this is the beginning um, of a research. Maybe first uh, um, a question to uh, Dr. Gora Parasit uh, as a question. Um, so um, your scientific research is, as you said, you know, you're the base of how you direct or how you deal with actors. So you said you were trained as a young actor just with a tiny book of Stanislavski. That was it. was the only thing that was allowed. You were not allowed to read anything else. But w right away, so this is not really how, how uh, one should approach artwork. But you know, you go to conferences, you go to, you engage with scientists. How do, did your experience or what you learned really influences your work on stage? How you direct, how you uh, conceive your, your um, artwork? What is the difference having gone and having engaged with neuroscience and how does it influence your work on stage? Um, it's because I have an acting um, experience. I, I have a bachelor's in acting, and I acted in the theater, in the National Theater in Lithuania, in Vilnius, the capital of Lithuania. And I know what it is, this proscenium theater, what it is in main roles, like second roles, third roles. So using neuroscience um, brings me as a, as a personality into the, into the and that me as myself, I am interesting on the stage. The way I think, I can really expose my research, the way I see things, the way I combine objects, and that is very exciting and it's new for me. Although the theater that I was forced to study or I chose to study and it was wrong, it's, um, I think it just spins in its own circle and it doesn't go really very far. Did I answer the question? <laughs> yeah, so you have a, you, I think it's a, a fascinating way that they, mm -hmm. they are scientific research, neuroscience is uh, your inspiration to direct and the work we, we, we saw on the uh, video, the latex work, the uh, silent operas or speak, spoke this, as they call a la japonaise, you know, they, that people re-speak dialogues mm -hmm. um, that come um, from, the, from the screen. Um, for your work, um, it is that you got nominated for the playwriting award. Do you feel it's the right category? Is that, you know, do you feel it is able to be able to communicate what you want to share, how you want to let people know about this work, is a, the play, um, the form. Yeah, it, the, the play was published, but I, I don't know what is the, the difference between being in contact in the, in the real uh, meeting. And, and I'm also working on a documentary film that will um, retrace the, the, the first quest, but also the second play I'm, I'm working on. And I wonder how it will be without being face to face. Um, I, I, I think the, the way I, it was so easier for me to get it, to understand people when I met them. And that's why I think people really have this feeling of, whoa, I discovered a whole new world and it's because we were, um, we met you, uh, they, there's no fourth wall, so it, it's really like a meeting. And uh, we also do some tests with the public uh, at some points with their, with their phones. And so I don't know about, like in the book it, it's described. So at this moment, um, people in the public have to switch phone with somebody they don't know. And we make them believe that um, they have to keep the phone up somebody they don't know until the end of the show, just so they can feel that they're letting a part of them. So if you read it and if you experiment it, of course it's not the same thing. So uh, it's, tr it's, it's interesting. Maybe the, uh, the book medium can bring something else that I, I can't measure, but um, I'm sure of the richness of meeting, especially in this team. Um, it's, it's more and more hard to concentrate two hours on something. We still have this at theater. Like, like now you read an article and they say, if you read this, yeah, it will last three minutes. Can you, can you do it? <laughs> but still in theater, we have this capacity of uh, being focused on one theme. And I, I think it's gonna be more and more rare in time. With reading, with a movie, you can just get out of there, but I think that getting from A to Z and just um, 
without any cut is more efficient because it's it's built like little stairs. Yeah, the temporality. Yeah, for articles where they say TLTR, which means too long to read, you know, people <laughs> text it back, say, I just can't. And, but theater does that, and I think this is a quite, quite a big hope that theater actually will research and will, will, will come bigger. I mean, it was so, so it was very impressive that with your brain, your thinking moved objects so that your brain waves really animated. Um, and something we spoke about it earlier, that musicians now will be able to think perhaps speech and the B minor will be played, you know, that your brain activity will control object of the world you live in without touching, without movements. It's, it's fascinating uh, what, what is awaiting for us and we do not know enough. Um, let Jenei, for you um, as a question, do you feel that the work you are creating, uh, the black movement projects and uh, the conversation, do you feel it's connected to the theater and performance world or do you say we, uh, this is a completely different field um, would you ever think of doing a play or to, of creating a, a temporality in space? Um, yeah, so honestly, like when I'm thinking about uh, black movement, I'm looking at all of the different ways that we move. And so that definitely incorporates theater. Um, I have not, I, I, I like actually with my project, I started with dance because I felt like it was the easiest entry point um, for me. However, um, I do uh, plan on expanding from there to um, gesture, to um, sports, to theater, to um, instruments and music, and you know all of these different because we move in so many different ways. And so um, for me, I'm just planning on um, different ways to categorize and also um, archive all of that. Um, into um, a library space, so, yeah. Mm -hmm. So your idea is more like an archive, a library, instead of having a result or a product on a stage in the duration of performance, maybe for both of you to think about, you know, uh, uh, what, what one could be done, vice versa. Uh, maybe uh, before we go soon to audience questions, wh how do you react to what is fascinating to your colleagues' work and some questions you ask or comments you would like to make about your presentations you saw. <laughs> well, uh, we talked with you in the morning. I really loved everything. There's this, per this personal story that is very close and it, you get really attached and then you, you get into the fair together with you and I really want to, uh, I had this inspiration. So I, if I listen and something is really interesting for me, I. My, my brain is get overloaded with the images. I even get sweaty sometimes and like my hands and I have to really stop this, uh, you know. So when you were talking and giving your speech, I was seeing the images of the theatrical performances, this kind of uh, lighting, you know, shows and so on and so forth. So this kind of fear projected into the images. And so maybe we can collaborate on some particular <laughs> things later. That would be great. Yeah. And I love the music so much, mm -hmm. very, very of this three minute video that you did. Incredible. Thank you. Yeah, and I'm really looking forward to of the theatrical performance and then this is, don't leave it just for the library. I mean, this is a great, great, great uh, s uh, part of the dance, of the, this problem that you're raising with the dance. I, 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 I did, did, did really love it. Yeah. I had a question, but I just wanted to see. Comment, yeah. I, I have a feeling I, I'm, I'm seeing like the very beginning of something that will get really, uh, that, that can go in many, many ways, like you're touching something so socially important. And I think, I hope you'll get some, like, I, because we were talking, you said like, oh, I'm doing stuff by myself, but I'm sure you'll get a big team to help you to, to push that really, really far. And it was really aesthetically super interesting and socially so important, so. That's great. And today we, we had time to talk a little bit more and I was so impressed because she was telling me that she was alone to do all these things. I could not believe it. Like all the costume, the latex work, the lightning, the set. Uh, it's, it, it's, it's hard work. Like yeah. uh, we need teams, girls. <laughs> that's that's you know. what I realized. Like I can't believe you do it alone and yeah. you too. And yeah, I'm, there I'm not alone, I have a good partner, but yeah, we, we need we need uh, 
Partners, support. yes, but there is this kind of institutional, non-institutional, you know, uh, way of being an artist, you know, and con considering these ideas being as a grounded ideas while they're not being supported by, you know, whatever, like a big theater or academia, you know. It's always a cunny feeling, uh, getting yourself into it, experimenting, you know, dragging all these actors together with you. I always have this fear, you know, I'm, I'm experimenting on this memory thing and I don't know if they're gonna like it, if they're gonna go with me yeah. together. So it's always a, a risk. So we have to establish this to be more less risky yeah. and more grounded together. <laughs> and Lajni, if I can put you on the spot, what came to your mind when you saw the other presentations? Yeah, um, so I think that for like your presentations, what I really loved was the stillness in some of the um, video work that you had. At first, when I first came and I like was watching your slides in the beginning, I thought that they were actually like statues. Like I didn't know that they were people. And I was just like, whoa, like the level of just like training and expression that they had to have and like endure and like have to go through was just like mind blowing for me. And like also just like all of the expressions that they made like throughout the performances, like they were just mind blowing. It was Thank really so gorgeous. Much. And like in the makeup it was just, yeah, everything's flawless. <laughs> so good. <laughs> and yeah, I and I think that like with your work, um, I was really like interested in it because I've been looking a lot into like the transhumanist movement. You know, I don't actually know like where I stand with it, mainly because um, with trans transhumanism, it's always like, you know, the people at the top or the people who have the most access to that sorts, to those sorts of, um, 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 uh, that space. And so, um, I really like that, like the ways in which you're diving into this like subject and, and yeah, I think that it's like really great. Yeah. Yeah, maybe we open it up um, um, right away and maybe uh, Michael, let's put the uh, lights on the audience so we uh, can see each other. And we're gonna give you the microphone if you have questions or also a comment, it doesn't have to be a question. Or maybe we have an answer also. Um, so we will have the microphone, May, our um, Next Generation Fellow here. She's here from, um, from Lebanon, Beirut, a Fulbright Scholar. And uh, we'll bring uh, the microphone around so maybe introduce yourself very shortly, your name and maybe what you do and then um, have a question or make a comment. So we have a dialogue and we could be a bit even more light on the audience, but here's the first question. Um, I'm Phil Beichman, I teach literature and write. Um, this is a question for Dominique. Uh, well, um, I was uh, very interested and even fascinated by your expose, but uh, it also made me very uncomfortable. Uh, but also thinking about your stake in it uh, too, and my stake too, in a way, because I wouldn't be alive. I might be alive, but maybe wouldn't be kicking like at you <laughs> if it wasn't for medical in intervention. So, first of all, the a uh, the augmented thing. Uh, this uh, what what I, I get the specter of eugenics and a master race. Then I was the one to laugh when you mentioned death, overcoming death. Now let's see, how about the planet can barely tolerate the population we have, and it can't. And then even if we could overcome death and we were machines, wouldn't it be monopolized by a small group who would then dominate the rest of us? In other words, the visions of Orwell and Huxley for the future were th that it would turn into a totalitarian direction. Now, you seem to have a blithe confidence in its progr being progressive but I think it's more likely to be. Yeah, f uh, first of all, she is raising these questions and she's making us aware, you know, it's not a proponent of it, they're open things, but, uh, but please do, uh, uh, please it's, do answer. It's, uh, it's all about ask, asking questions. I met some progressive people, I met libertarians, I met people that have all kinds of thoughts on how are we gonna deal as a society with these augmentations, because for now you can see that it is not fair already. Um, I learned uh, two weeks ago, I didn't know, I'm, I'm lucky to live in Canada as a diabetic person. I learned two weeks ago that in the, the States, some people take a bus to go to Canada to buy insulin or in Mexico, I couldn't believe it. So what am I in the United States? I'm not doing theater. 
I'm working for my meds. And this frightens me. And at the end of Posthumain, I just addressed the question like, okay, I look in the future, am I more free than the, the beginning of my quest? I don't know. And I cannot say for now how it is going to develop. And transhumanists will always bring you on the fact that, oh, this technology, we're working for, to make it available for people. So who can I believe? I don't know. Some groups, I don't trust them. Some groups, I do trust that it comes from the heart. But it is, so, it, it is too hard now because we have a step in there. It is dangerous to just push it away and don't address these questions. And your worries are totally uh, legitimate. And especially in the States, you have a transhumanist party. So uh, be interested, ask them questions. They just elected a new president uh, who seemed, he was a Democrat before. We'll see what he's doing. But their goal is, uh, I think, depending on every uh, individual. So the only thing I'm trying to do is that we talk about it because we, y yes, there's, we need medicine. And when I say that the transhumanists want to prolong life, uh, like extension, radical ex life extension, where's the line between your doctor that is trying to radical life your extension and these people? I don't know. But I, I can tell you that Yes, for the United States, it's even more important that you talk about these things because uh, I know that it's a mess with uh, insurance companies. And I, I'm sorry, but I, I don't know what I would do here. So yes, it, it's really important to, and eugenics, I would, yes, there's a risk, but I, I, I would be a little bit careful with this. So I, I'm just trying to, uh, for the second show, especially address the political and philosophical question and still talk about this without um, trying to put people just in one group because it, it is like feminism. Do they all agree? <laughs> Some of them think uh, she's super extreme, she's not enough. She, it's, it's as complex as, as other movements, even religious movements. It's so. And I think this is why theater performance is a great way to look at it from different sides and represent without giving fully answers. But other comments, thoughts, uh, answers? Uh, yeah? And then you. Uh, my name's Henry Kaiser. I design and manage XR productions for Verizon Media and Yahoo News. Um, having been working in the XR space for a couple of years now, I know that I've brought in a lot of collaborators from the arts and things who've never necessarily explored these futurist ideas or these futurist technologies in, in their own field until their first time they're engaging in these spaces. And I wanted to ask each of you, as you've brought in collaborators, artists who've never been thinking about the issues or the technologies that you wanted to prime them to engage with you on, how do you initially broach those topics in order to effectively collaborate with people who are very new to a space that you are looking to pursue? The question is, oh, okay. Oh, um, well, for me, I do it in a lot of different ways. Um, I really like to start everything with like a phone conversation or like meeting in person. And um, I think that even in the ways in which you know I teach the workshops, I try to make everything very um, non not intimidating. And you know, um, like so within the workshops. Um, the way that I approach like teaching people who have never seen um, extended reality tools before, um, I sort of just like say, hey, like here are a lot of just, they're just tools, you know? Like these are just different types of tools. They're just different types of technologies. You know, don't get, you know, super frustrated if you don't understand how to use them right now and, and today. You know, we're gonna go through a lot of things and you know, really what the important part of this is, is to really just like raise questions and to, you know, basically just know that this is an introduction. Um, I was actually talking about this earlier today, how like I go to a lot of tech workshops and sometimes the instructor will just like throw a bunch of just like stuff at you. And it's very, um, it's very intimidating. It's very like, you know, not inviting, even though 
you know, you think a workshop space is supposed to be inviting and supposed to be like, you know, introducing you to something new. And so I think that it just comes to like, you know, even with the conversations, like for me, talking with um, a dance anthropologist and a writer slash animator, like those are people who, you know, like for instance, um, uh, Amy, like she didn't really know anything about like extended reality and this is her first time even having a conversation about it. But for me, I thought that it was just important to like, you know, still get, you know, the conversation from her because she knows so much about field work and anthropology and which is something that I don't know about. So I think that it's really just like, you know, highlighting just like what people know and just like finding um, worth in all of the different things that people bring to the table. And um, yeah, because there's so many things that people know that, that are worthy to the space that should be there and letting them know that it's important for them to continue you know, knowing what they know and just like find this as an addition to their knowledge and not as like the end all be all is um, very important. Um, for me, um, to do everything very carefully, step by step, uh, I approach neuroscience, cognition science, with through synesthesia field, firstly, uh, studying master's degree. We map with the students, uh, London Metro map, according to lexical gustatory synesthesia modes. We were working with uh, synesthetic association in, in, in London, and we just, you know what is lexical gustatory synesthesia, when you hear the sound and then you cr your brain provokes immediately the taste of something, and it's it genuine, it's not, it's not that you get with associative memory. So in, we invited um, a genuine lexical gustatory synesthet to map these things. Uh, so to map uh, London tube, tube, tube map and give the, uh, for each name of the, of the metro station to give the lexical gustatory synesthetic notion on it. So uh, I think the Piccadilly Circus was like a smoked salmon or something like that. So, so gradually I grew up to the um, understanding of um, what I want to do in my field and I, um, it's actually based on lots of research. Um, eating a lot of material that I can actually carefully give it to the actors. Um, the 2017, I was a part of the Brain on Art conference in Valencia, organized by uh, Houston University. And uh, for me, it was, I, 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 scared to, I was scared to go there because I, I thought as a, as a theater practitioner, as a director, I will not be able to say anything. But it's a matter of your homework. So what I did, instead of going to the parties in, in the evening, I read every single article of every single doctor who did a speech in the conference, just to know the terms of what they're speaking. And the science is such an easy thing. It's much easier to understand and make a conversation rather than with the artist next to you. <laughs> Because there's a, such a mystery so all the time. You need to guess what the actor thinks. There's so much psychology. And the science is the pure data. So that's where we, we um, proposed um, with, the, with the GTA lab. They do these hackathons. And there was one of the hackathon, Aust Austri Austrian lab GTA hackathon during the, the, the conference. Uh, we were uh, controlling the little ball called Sphero with the, with the brain waves, all the light or the eyes that react to the lights. And I put a bit of dramaturgy on the top, you know, so we, s we were solving loneliness. So that little sparrow was my friend, and my boyfriend who lived far away, and we, that's, where, that's the way we communicated. And, uh, and, uh, and we won the, as a most eruptive, you know, prototype for, for, for this model, the EG system. But uh, so, and then, you know, after the conference, I felt a little bit more confident. I gained more contacts uh, with the Houston University, GTEC lab in Austria, uh, another lab in, 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 in San Francisco. And they really want to engage on work and they're very careful. So now we're adapting some EEG systems on the stage with the actors, which we before I thought it's a bit, um, the question of ethics, whether I can do that. So with the, with the knowledge and care. And uh, then the art comes next whatever we do with aesthetics, how the actors react, what we do with the data, you know, and uh, what kind of themes and problems we are solving with that. Because with all these methods, structures, schemes, we can really talk about so many things. Uh, and that's the driven kind of a basis of my work at the moment. A part of this all aesthetical visuals, you know, then collaborations, which are the artists, composers, dramaturgs, dramaturgs, costume design, so on and so forth. So, yeah. Thank you. <laughs>
I'm not sure I got the question. Sometimes I struggle with English. That just happened when you talked. <laughs> would, you, would you repeat it, please? It's the way we work with people in science. You well, want to know? Or, or when you're preparing to approach a collaborator, as a, another actor that you're bringing into a production that you're designing, how do you mentally prime them oh to my work God. with you okay. on something that they've never thought about before? Oh my God, we had so many discussions. We could have not rehearsed at all and just talk. <laughs> so that was a hard part with the actors. Um, and I, I was always like bringing in uh, data and then we were getting in other, other stuff and then, no, oh, let, let's get back to the scene because we were totally getting lost. Um, but also at first when the, the, the play was created, we were working with this uh, girl you saw that was uh, starting the ESG, um, it was surprising because she didn't talk the whole process and in the end I just asked, okay, because the last question is how far are you willing to go? So the, it was the only time the performers could really say what they're willing to do and we were pretty surprised because she said, well, I'm bouncing with my computer. I'm a creative person, but I'm even more creative with him because it, we, we, we can go so much further and I'm looking forward to have an iPhone in the head because I'm, I, I, I'm, I'm fed up with this and that, oh my God, okay, we have a, somebody that is closer than we thought to all these things. So it was just like super rich and sometimes they were lost, they were changing their minds. We were just paradox all the time. So. It was really nice to, uh, to discuss, but on the other side, people I was um, uh, studying, uh, how do you arrive in the conversation? Uh, what, what is she doing there? At first, my first meeting with cyborgs in Berlin, like I had the magic card of the disease, and then you have the magic card of the artist. But when I was saying like, uh, well, I'm, I'm doing research for a play, but oh, I'm looking an alternative for my glucose meter. Okay, so um, it, it, it came with time. It, it, they didn't really get it at the beginning, but there's one really important character in the play I always talk about, and he's a great man. He's the founder of the group, uh, the cyber group in Berlin. He's called Enno Park, and he has a cochlear implant. And so he would be deaf, but now he has two computers uh, related to his brain. And um, he's a programmer. So he wants to open it. He wants to be able to play with the computers he has in his own head. And the company that produced this cochlear implant said, we own your earring. So that I, I had so much love for his quest. And at first, he didn't really get what I was doing at theater play in Montreal. But more and more, he was getting involved. And when we did the play in Berlin, he played his own role. He was on stage with us. He appeared in the end. The actor was playing him uh, the whole way, but in the end, we were showing a video, but he came and he did his play also in Quebec. So it was really nice, a nice uh, exchange. So now he's, um, yeah, we keep in uh, close contact. And I think he realized that what he thought was just like, it's a play in Montreal. And the other, okay, it has an impact. People discuss about it. And we're clearly doing the same thing, but with different uh, means. Maybe two more questions, one here and then. So my name is Xiao Xiong Lin. I'm doing a neuroscience PhD at the moment. So I'm really interested, um, how do you collaborate or um, um, get involved with science uh, scientists? How can we get involved? <laughs> yeah. So how does he get involved with you guys? It's by reading in, in bibliography in the end there's like uh, names of the people who are working in the field usually after the article. So I always check, you know, who is doing what after I really like the react, react article and then I follow them online and I see what they do, if I can get in touch, you know, so on and so forth. But I think um, this Brain on Art conference is great. It opened me lots of lots of uh, kind of doors, the way I understand the art and I, I feel the necessity of the artist to come into this field quite broadly. So, yeah. 
but you also mean how can you meet them. Yeah, I mean so you just write an email, right? Yeah. <laughs> Most probably. Right? Yeah. We, we can <laughs> talk in a few minutes. <laughs> we have a reception. So um, this is what also these evenings are for. But yeah, it's very easy. And I think. And for example, doing your production of artwork, have you ever like um, um, collaborated with some any scientists? Or is it have, you, have you, in any three of you, a, a, like a scientist, scientist on the team? Yeah, I'm always emailing, asking questions. Yeah, before I start to even to work with actors, even though it's not so, uh, um, how to say, you you can't not see it in the pr in the not results obvious. so much. Mm -hmm. It's not so obvious. It's work behind, but I'm very careful of what I do. Always make this massive research. It's crazy. So th th these two or three people, actors, have involved in the processes are always very careful before I go into the rehearsal space. So I always emailing. If I can't meet people in person because of the distance, I always email and ask. And they're usually very approachable as far as I got there. So, yeah. Okay. Last question. <laughs> Comment. So Ashley. Ashley is your name, huh? No. What's your name? Ashley. Sorry. Uh, I'm, I'm the, the worst person with names, I'm sorry. Um, this dust, you can buy, uh, you can buy figures on, on dust on this platform, 3D platform, am I right? This DAS? Um, DAZ. DAZ, you can buy, you can buy this, I think. You can yeah, um, DAZ is a free um, character building software that you can use, and they have um, different packs that you can buy, and also packs that are free. But I think you can also buy a, a figure from someone who created it, isn't it, that platform also? Like yes. You can pay the creator for this. Will you, do you think about putting your uh, creations on there one day, whatever platform this is, to buy them by the name you name them? Do you think about this? Um, I thought about it. I think that um, first, before I like think about selling anything though, I just want to talk to like lawyers. <laughs> that's, that's, <laughs> I, that, that's what have been my next question. Yeah. Like who has the copyright then? The exactly. dancer, you, the creator? So here's the thing. Um, and uh, I'll go back to the Fortnite example. Um, those lawsuits were dropped because the movements weren't considered choreography um, under copyright law. And so that said, it's like going to be very difficult to um, basically, you know, protect the dances using, I guess, the law. So um, I've been thinking about um, and brainstorming different ways. And if you, uh, any of you, have like different like ideas of how to do that, um, uh, let's talk. But <laughs> uh, but yeah, I think that um, one of the things that I'm really passionate about and um, I think that's going to be very difficult is um, finding ways to actually um, protect the data once I uh, have it. Um, right now, it's just like with me, like I just have everything and I've been using it to work on my own projects. Um, but I think it's going to be a lot of conversations with the people who um, I'm, I've, a lot of my collaborators and um, in learning how they, I guess, like view the value of their, I guess, like the a monetary value of their movements, and um, and I think that that would actually be part of um, determining like how much it would cost. Um, yeah, so it's just a huge. There's just like so many like different conversations from there that uh, I just started having. So, yeah. Yeah, I think uh, it, it does show new work does create new 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 exciting things, new problems. Who owns what? Like ensemble work. We had a big workshop on rights for the performer, but people get together who owns what, the digital work. So um, it's also shows it's something very new and we learned a lot. I think it's inspiring. We hope uh, you will follow us, we will follow your work and we have a follow up event, maybe one day a symposium or a conference also to focus even more on it. So it was a fascinating um, insight uh, for us who do not know enough. But I think the uh, point of all of you and especially you is very valid. We need to talk about this. It needs to be out there. We need to be aware. You also said so much is hidden right now in labs from Google and anywhere. We do not know what is going on. We should know and we don't. What already is or might be happening. So um, this is a contribution which in theater always has to help to find out what's real, what's not real. And I think the question was in cyborgs and the digital existence of uh, avatars and other is uh, old questions like a Cornet in L'Illusion or others to ask who, who, what is, who are we? Where do we come from? What's real? What is not real? So. It's a fantastic uh, contribution, thank you, and really thank you from all the way to Lithuania, from Montreal, and 
I also said, come you going on a subway. We never know in New York <laughs> what is happening, you know? So it's a big challenge. Sometimes it's more insecure. So thank you, and again, thank you for coming. Hope you will join us for a little drink, and you can talk today. Thank you. Thank you.